Hi friends, my name is Stu Armstrong and I am the deacon here in Macarelli and Anna's Cologne. Um, and it's just a, a real privilege to be able to open God's word with you for this vacation Sunday. If you have a Bible, I'd really encourage you to open it, whether it's your own or a pew Bible in front of you or maybe on your phone. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4 today. So Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just take a moment to pray wherever we are. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth, for its challenge. We thank you that it points us to Jesus. And we pray now, God, wherever we are, by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us, that you would stir in our hearts, and that you would turn our attention to that same Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. There's uh, an old movie called Saving Private Ryan, and some of you are going to feel particularly old since I have just considered a 20-year-old uh, movie old, but there's an old movie called Saving Private Ryan set in World War II, and it follows uh, Tom Hanks. Uh, his character is called Captain Miller, and Captain Miller puts together a small team of soldiers who traverse uh, occupied France in search of Matt Damon's character, Private James Ryan. Now, Private Ryan is the last remaining of four brothers. The other three all died in the D-Day landings. And so Captain Miller and his team are on the lookout for him to extract him and send him home to his grieving mother. Now, throughout the movie, across their journey in France, a number of the soldiers are killed in action. And when they finally do find Private Ryan, they get caught up in a skirmish, in a battle. And in that instance, several more of the team are killed as well. And spoiler alert, in the closing moments of the movie, Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, is mortally wounded. And as Private Ryan runs up to him to check on him with his dying breath, he speaks to Private Ryan and he says, James, earn this, earn it. So what does he mean by earn this? Well, I think we all know he's saying, live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was made for you. Live a life worthy of all that has been done for you. And in Ephesians chapter 4, which we just read, Paul says something kind of similar. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, we cannot earn this calling. We cannot earn our salvation, our relationship with Jesus. This is all based on his grace. And Paul's already explained this to the Ephesians. In chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. And in his incredible work on the Sermon on the Mount, Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, in this sermon, our Lord condemns once and forever all trust in human endeavor and natural ability in the matter of salvation. Paul is not telling us to earn our relationship with God. He's not telling us that we can earn our salvation. Far from it. That's all built on grace and grace alone. As Dallas Willard said, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. So while he's not telling us to earn our salvation, he is saying that there is work to be done. And as we know from James 2, 26, faith without works is dead. Grace is not opposed to action. And actually, grace abounds when we partner with the Holy Spirit in our sanctification, which is just a churchy word for our spiritual formation and growth into Jesus. So unlike Private Ryan, we're not being told to earn this, but there are similarities. Here, Paul is exhorting us. He's challenging us. He's encouraging us and charging us to live a new way of life, to become a new kind of human, to live a life of obedience, of sacrificial love, of holiness, of eternal significance. He is charging us to live a life worthy, live in a manner worthy of that, to live in such a way that we honor and reflect the glory of God and all that he has done for us. And this is an enormous challenge. And this is difficult, but there's also an incredible encouragement hidden in here as well. Did you notice that this calling comes before the charge? The calling to relationship with Jesus, to repentance, to salvation, to eternal purpose in his kingdom. That calling comes before the charge to live in a manner worthy. You see, we have been chosen not because of our lifestyle, not because we have earned God's favor, not because any one of us has ascended to some sort of super Christian status, but just because of God's good grace. And Paul tells us that in Ephesians 1, that this grace has been lavished upon us. And this all means that our identity is not found in what we do or what we achieve or in the good that we contribute to the world. Our identity is firmly rooted in the person of Christ. We are first and foremost his. Our identity is not found in what we do, but what we do flows out of that identity. See, you're loved for who you are, not for what you produce. You are embraced in your brokenness, not in your excellence. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And God showed his love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you have responded to that call to repentance and to salvation of turning away from sin and towards God, then you're chosen, you're graced, you're forgiven, you are a blessed child of God, adopted into his family and filled by the Holy Spirit, which Paul says in Ephesians 1.14, guarantees our salvation now for all eternity. First and foremost, on this vocation Sunday, if we have turned to Christ, we belong to him. We are his and he is ours. You are in Christ you are a daughter or son of Almighty God. You are an ambassador for his kingdom. You are a co-heir of heaven and of earth. You are seen, you are known, and you are loved. And this has always been the way that God functions. It has always been grace from the very, very beginning. See, in the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, God pronounces Adam and Eve as very good before they produce anything, before they begin to work in the garden. God values them because he loves them, because they are made in his image, not because they can contribute anything to him or to his good. 
but sin broke that very good state of being. But praise God, Jesus, the second Adam, as Paul calls him in Romans, restores our relationship to God. And we can once again rest in the knowledge that we are accepted by him through Christ, not for what we achieve, but because of who he is. So, Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of that calling. You're called to salvation and your call to sanctification, to growing in Christ-likeness. South African theologians Craig Bartholomew and Pav Goodsward write, we urgently need to recover a robust doctrine of sanctification, which we defined as becoming whole, becoming holy as we are shaped into the image of Christ and into vessels fit for his purpose. Such formation by the Spirit accompanies us on our life journey until we die. Indeed, it not only accompanies us, but, we need, but needs to be the wellspring of our lives, the journey in, which is deep engagement with Scripture, with God, with a small group, and with oneself, from which issues our journey out into the world. Only thus will we be equipped to live the solution in our world today. Becoming whole, becoming holy. What does this look like, and how do we do it? How do we walk in a manner worthy of this calling? Well, Paul tells us in verses two and three, he says, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul says something really similar to the church in Colossae in Colossians 1 verses 10 to 12, and he tells them to walk in joy and thankfulness and knowledge of God and power and fruitfulness and endurance. What does it mean to walk worthy? Well, it means to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It means to cultivate the character of Christ by adopting the mind of Christ, by living according to his ways. And it means, as Paul says here in verse four, to hope, to hope that things can change, to hope that things can get better, to hope because God is good and faithful and never changes. And the same God who spoke to Abraham and Sarah and said, nothing is impossible. is the same God who calls us today. And for Paul, he defines hope in Ephesians 1.18 as the hope of the riches of his glorious inheritance and the hope of the immeasurable greatness of his power. In the words of the hymn writer, it means strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. It is the promise of a heavenly prize and of an earthly purpose. It is knowing that God still moves today. It is knowing that forgiveness is still available today. It is knowing that transformation is possible today. Why? How? Because Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. God is calling each of us to live a life of obedience and of holiness and of purpose and of grace in the power of the Spirit, with the community of believers, and as the theologian James Smith says, as a people not for our own sake, but for the sake of the world. How do we live this life? How are we sanctified? How do we walk ever more faithfully in a manner worthy of the calling for which we are called? How do we become more Christ-like? Well, by beholding the glory of God in Christ and trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to change us. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. It is by practicing the way of Jesus, by apprenticing under Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. He
here Jesus talks about his easy yoke, and it's important for us to notice here that while the yoke is easy, there's still a yoke. There's still work to do, and grace is not opposed to work, but to earning. We have the privilege here of partnering with the Holy Spirit in our transformation into Christ-likeness by meditating on the person of Christ and walking in the way of Christ. My hero, Simon Ponsonby, says, Christ is sinless, and as we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit, something of that sinless nature rubs off on us. As we devote ourselves to Jesus, constantly looking to him, meditating on his sublime words, his sinless life, his grace-filled acts, his agonizing substitutionary death, his victorious resurrection, his glorious ascension, his majestic reign, his anticipated glory, his unassailable power, his matchless beauty, his breathtaking wisdom. Oh, as we look face to face with Jesus, so we are transformed perfected like a caterpillar changed into a butterfly. But we must make time to meditate on Christ and allow the Spirit to mold us into his likeness. What incredible words. And from this incredible identity, the immense privilege of being an adopted daughter or son of God, welcomed into his family, becoming ever more like his one and only begotten son, Jesus, out of this incredible identity flows our particular calling, our vocation, our, our divine purpose, our participation in the redemption and reconciliation and restoration and recreation work that God is doing in the world. As Leslie Newbegin wrote, all true witness to Christ is the overflowing of a reality too great to be contained. When I was in P7 in Carried Off Primary, I tried out for the football team. And there were 12 of us tried out for the football team, and I was selected as the substitute. If you've ever wondered what your particular role or purpose is, so have I. Paul's primary metaphor for the church is the body of Christ, and he talks in a number of places about how each body part has a function to play. And I've often felt like an appendix. I'm there, I don't really know what I have to do, but I'm still part of the body. Maybe you can relate to that. While each of us does have a particular role to play, each of us does have a function in the body, and it is unique to you, to your personality, which God is forming, to your character, to your natural abilities, to those learned abilities, and particularly to the gifts which the Holy Spirit has graced you with. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks a little bit not only about what those particular roles might be in the church, but what they are to do. He says here in verse 11, and he, that's Jesus, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, but rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We each have a function to play in the church and in the kingdom. The reformer Martin Luther talked about how each member of the body of Christ has a calling into the three great arenas of human life, the household, the church, and the state. And these particular offices and giftings that Paul has talked about here in Ephesians 4, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, their role is not to do ministry on behalf of the church in these three arenas, but as we read, it's to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Each of us has a ministry. 
not whoever you are and wherever you are, whatever you do with your life, your vocation is how you contribute to the world for the glory of God and for the sake of the kingdom. And it may be that you are a stay-at-home parent. Well, what's your vocation? It's to train your kids in righteousness. It's to point them to Jesus. It's to teach them the scriptures, to teach them how to pray. Maybe you're a lawyer. What's your vocation? Well, it's to use that heart for justice, for the common good. Maybe it's to draw alongside young offenders and to make sure that they get a fair hearing. Maybe you drive a bin lorry. What's your vocation? Well, it's to take that care for the society and the community around you. It's to take that heart for creating a safe environment and to use that for the glory of God and to do it to the best of your ability. But our vocation is not just narrowly focused on one of these three arenas. It plays out in all of them. And on this vocation Sunday, we want to challenge you to step into that with all of your might, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to challenge you to live your life in a manner worthy of that vocation. The missiologist uh, called Michael Frost talks about living questionable lives, not questionable in the sense of like suspicious or dodgy in any way, but questionable in the sense that your life stirs curiosity in other people that you parent in such a way that people look and think, there's something different about you. That you work in such a way in whatever job that you have, that people think, I wanna know what they've got. We live questionable lives, that is our vocation. But for some of us, God is perhaps stirring this morning something within you. For some of us, God is calling us to those offices of apostle and prophet and evangelist and shepherd and teacher, not to do ministry on behalf of everyone else, not to do ministry to everyone else, but to do it alongside them, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Because the reality is, real ministry happens not in a place like this, but in the world outside. Real ministry happens where the kingdom and the world interface and meet. And some of us are being called today. Some of us have a stirring in our hearts. Some of us are hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and calling us to equip the saints, to help build up the body of Christ in unity and faith and knowledge of the Son of God. Some of us have a passion for seeing others grow into the fullness of Christ. Some of us have a passion for doctrine and for speaking against human cunning and deceitfulness and the winds of the world. Some of us have a passion for speaking truth and love to par. And perhaps today, perhaps today on this Vocation Sunday, God is calling you to step out of whatever sphere you find yourself in now and to trust him in pursuing that particular calling, whatever that might look like. If that is you, we would really encourage you to, this morning, speak to your rector, speak to the DDOs, speak to somebody that works in the diocese, speak to a trusted, mature believer who is part of your life, and begin a conversation where you pursue and discern that together. What a privilege it is to serve the church and to equip the saints. And if that's not you today, hear this. Your vocation is to be Christ where you are. Your vocation is to point people towards the one and only Son of God. 
to extend that same call and that invitation that you have received to relationship with him through repentance and faith and his grace alone and to invite them to join you in that. Your vocation is to live your life worthy of that and to help others do the same. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you once more for your word. And we pray that wherever we are, that by your Holy Spirit, you would be stirring and speaking and convicting us. That if we have not yet made a decision to surrender our lives to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, your only begotten Son, Jesus, then may this morning be the day that we answer that call. And if that is you this morning, just silently in your heart, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I am sorry. I am sorry for the times I have let you down. I am sorry that I have walked away from you, that I have lived my life neglecting you. But I thank you that I can be forgiven through your work on the cross. Fill me with your Holy Spirit today. I want to answer your call to salvation. Amen. And if today you are a Christian, if you are following Christ, and you want to walk a little bit closer to him, if you feel like perhaps your life has strayed somewhat from that manner worthy of your calling, please pray with me now. Holy Spirit, come, rest on me. Fill me once again. Give me that great hope of eternal glory with you and of significance and purpose in my life now. Help me daily to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and walk more closely with him. Amen. And finally, if today you're feeling called to equip the saints to pursue some form of ministry, whether that is youth work or evangelism or administration or perhaps even ordained ministry, please pray this prayer with me. Father God, I hear your call and I surrender. Whatever this means for my life, I am wholly yours. Lead me forward. I love you. I thank you for your love. Amen.